And I'll switch languages right now because Britta will be doing her interview in English. So this might be a good uh, yeah. place to switch. Emojin is head of city engagement and integration at Arrival, a really cool British uh, company um, that looks to bring zero emission transportation yeah, to the cities. Yeah, it's a really innovative concept and I'm really happy to have her on board. We see her already and it's nice to have a chat at the beginning of her presentation and to see what Arrival is doing. So at the beginning I will ask her a few questions so we get a deeper insight into Arrival before. So yeah, as you already said, um, Arrival is um, offering zero emissions mobility solutions for city. You're a pioneer in e-mobility for public transport. And everywhere in the media you read that Arrival aims to disrupt the automotive sector. And in a few minutes you will, um, talk, or you will talk more about Arrival and we will immerse with you into Arrival, into the concept. And, but to say it in a few words, what does that exactly mean to disrupt the automotive sector? Ich, I can't hear oh. you, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's no. so embarrassing, we've had a year sorry. of lockdown. Uh, still sorry, still but now, now the stage is yours. Um, so yes, um, I'm saying that, you know, as we know, the, the automotive industry has existed for many, many decades. And during that time, it's really been about optimizing the industry for internal combustion, electric, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. So as we are now required to make this a normal shift towards electrification, we kind of see that the industry isn't necessarily set up to support those vehicles. And so Arrival has sort of set out with the mission that if we're able to sort of start from scratch and completely reimagine what it means to be an electric vehicle, um, then what could that look like? How can we reconsider the supply chain, reconsider the technologies, reimagine the user experience, and importantly, create a vehicle that is at sort of price parity or at least price competitiveness with um, its internal combustion engine counterparts. So that's what we're setting out to do and, and so far so good. Very, very interesting. And you, as we already know, you are head of city engagement and integration at Arrival. Could you give us a little insight what exactly you're driving forward at Arrival? Yeah, I um, appreciate that it's a bit of a weird and obscure job title and probably doesn't exist in too many automotive companies. But what it really means is that we we really recognize that mobility challenges are very, very different from a from city to city and even, you know, from street to street within a city. Um, so my job is to kind of, you know, really get under the skin of a city, find out what those specific challenges are and figure out a way that we can best partner with the city such that they're getting the maximum value from arrival being present in, in that um, environment. That sounds really interesting and super important. And last but not least, before you start with your presentation, I would like to know you live and work in London. I'm at the moment uh, based in Hamburg. And what is the city, what is London doing to change mobility sustainably? Like in your opinion, what can other cities like Hamburg, where I am at the moment, learn from London? It's really interesting because I think, you know, living in London, we can have this very London centric view of the world. But actually, we need to recognize that London is pretty unique. It's exceptionally walkable. Um, it has enormous access to green space, uh, very sort of frequent, uh, frequently and, and dotted throughout the city. Public transportation is very much a way of life. It's not an unusual way to travel and certainly doesn't carry any kind of social stigmas. Um, Owning a car is, is actually pretty inconvenient, uh, partly due to congestion zones, low emission zones, ultra low emission zones, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think when we look towards other cities, we need to think, OK, well, how, why is it so walkable? And actually, we have incredible wayfinding and it connects very well to the public transit network. Um, and as we kind of, you know, get into the world opening up a little bit more, I think all cities need to look to London as being sort of, I think, a bit of a beacon of like how transit can work and make sure that transit continues to be the first choice over and above um, private vehicles, which I know, given sort of various fears around uh, the coronavirus, it might be, that might be the go-to option. Thanks for the little insight. And now we start with your presentation and uh, yeah, I and all the viewers, we can't wait to, to learn more about Arrival and what they are doing radically dif different. Now, Emojin, the stage, stage is yours.
Thank you so much. Oh, I'd forgotten that this is coming through. A uh, very quick question. I think I can control it on my screen. Yeah, sorry, one second. Um, okay. So I'm going to speak a little bit today about um, arrival and what we're doing to think beyond just about sustainable transportation and how we can start thinking about resiliency and specifically how we can think about resiliency within urban environments. So we were founded in 2015. Uh, since that time, we've grown to over 2000 people and we've been focusing on how can we reimagine electric vehicles such that we can get price competitiveness with um, internal combustion engine equivalents. And the result is that we've had significant sort of, we've gone a significant interest and investment. We've got customers such as UPS and earlier this year, we actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange. But I think sort of more interestingly is that actually we've been working alongside our customers to deliver very, very fit for purpose and, and beautiful user experiences. The van that you see on the screen there is not just a van, it's actually somebody's place of work and it needs to function as a place of work in a really seamless and an enjoyable way. Um, and so that has been a real critical part of the design process. Um, equally considered, I think is our, oh, I meant to press play. This gives you a bit more of, um, of an overview of, of those vehicles. Um, we've been focusing on commercial vehicles, so buses, vans, and recently we announced um, a vehicle for ride hailing. And the main rationale really is that actually commercial vehicles are a pretty neglected segment when it comes to electrification, um, despite the fact that they're so important. In the UK, I think one in 10 people directly rely on a van for their day-to-day -day jobs. So if we can electrify and focus on this particular segment, we can start to bring sustainable transportation to more people more quickly. Um, I mentioned the bus as well, and I think this has been equally considered with regards to the beautiful user experience. And I never thought I'd use those words, beautiful and bus in, in the same sentence, but here we are. Um, and so it works very seamlessly, not just for sort of, you know, um, the driver and the passenger, but actually, anyone who needs to interact with this vehicle. Um, you'll notice, for example, that the passenger sit, uh, seats exist on a cantilever. And that's because cleaners typically only have four minutes to clean a bus. So we want to avoid any kind of nooks and crannies that can make that job uh, less sort of straightforward. Um, so what's kind of been key to making this possible? Um, and that probably comes down to six technologies, which we consider our new method or kind of secret source, or I suppose, not so secret anymore. Um, so first of all, we have our um, plug and play components. These are designed entirely in house. We're incredibly vertically integrated. And these are components that fit within a size architecture. And that's important because it means that they can go together almost like a, in a Tetris formation, which means that sort of swapping or upgrading components can then become very, very easy. Um, I think most importantly, actually, though, is that they're software enabled. And so this means that we can do vast amount of um, uh, monitoring and predictive maintenance remotely as well. Um, next, we have our modular skateboard platform, so-called because it is completely flat, much like a, a skateboard. And this ho houses uh, the chassis and the powertrain. Um, we're very unusual in that we don't use um, aluminium or steel body panels, but instead we have this in-house developed composite material. Um, it's extremely robust, um, extremely durable, and of course commercial vehicles have to withstand an enormous amount of wear and tear. Um, but also it's very lightweight, which of course is, is incredibly important when you consider range and, and power requirements that customers may have. Um, and it has very cheap tooling, so all in all sort of major pluses which help us really keep down the cost of our electric vehicles. Um, our vehicles are completely connected. They kind of epitomize the term device on wheels. Um, and that means that our vehicles can be supported by a number of software management tools. So fleet management, driver's apps, um, you name it, there's sort of that wonderful digital ecosystem supporting the vehicles. And so when you kind of reflect on that list, you can kind of see that sustainability is considered at every juncture. But I think the component that is maybe the most exciting is our microfactory approach. Um, so called because, um, have I skipped to the next one? 
So one second. Yeah, there we go. Um, so called because they have a very, very small footprint. So to put it into context, about 11th of the size of a traditional automotive manufacturing plant. And because of that, they can sit in existing warehouse spaces, which typically sit on sort of the outskirts of, uh, of a city or an urban environment. Um, and this is in large part because we employ a huge amount of, of robotics. We have a very modular approach to our vehicles. And this means that we can manufacture in um, cell-based assembly rather than sort of an enormous snaking um, assembly line. That also gives us the opportunity to actually start thinking about how we can localize supply chain, create local jobs, avoid onward polluting logistics, for example. And so suddenly we're sort of seeing that we're thinking about sustainability in terms of like extending the usable life of the vehicle, stretching the bandwidth of our technologies, creating local jobs. And you think, well, if we have this local presence, what else can we and really should we be doing to support, um, you know, fit for purpose, sustainable mobility? Um, and that's where the sort of the cities really, really come in, and particularly the work that I look at. So when we speak to cities, we start to sort of really understand that sustainability is not just about electrification. It's, of course, a key enabler, but it is not the full story. And actually, cities are forced to think about mobility in terms of how does it impact a person's quality of life? How does it influence their access to healthcare, to education, to jobs, to friends. And so suddenly we have to think about mobility in terms of how it can increase the frequency and access to goods and services via equitable, safe, resilient and sustainable multimodal transportation, which is no sort of small ask, I don't think. And as a rival, if we have this very local presence and we have an enormous amount of technologies, how can we contribute to this future vision of mobility? When you dig a little deeper and you start to take this sort of holistic approach, you realize very quickly that actually it doesn't come down to just the city or just an automotive um, manufacturer like ourselves or even a transportation provider. But actually, it's an incredibly diverse set of stakeholders who, to make this effective, really need to work in a really collaborative and cohesive way that importantly is sort of motivated by the sh same shared vision um, and same sort of mode of, of execution. And that's something that we as sort of a rival really want to kind of to be involved with and understand and sort of bring this community of mobility stakeholders together. And when you think of it in these terms, you suddenly think, well, we can't talk about global mobility challenges or even national mobility challenges, but we need to start thinking about it on a city by city level. And this is in part because we understand that how you use a service and how you use transportation is in part down to kind of the physical infrastructure, which of course varies between cities. So, you know, presence of bus routes, presence of charging, um, presence of, of bus stops, for example. But actually equally as critical is what's perceived as quality of service and what does satisfaction mean? And what does it mean to a particular community? And that's where you start to see the kind of real um, sort of variation between cities. So for many European cities, we might think that, you know, how a challenge might be, how can we make traveling by bus as convenient as owning a private vehicle? And how can we consider sort of time as a real key resource that we have to optimize across this sort of multimodal uh, transportation network? But actually in some, and particularly in US cities, that's kind of not the full story. We have to instead think about what are the cultural perceptions behind bus travel? Um, are any solutions driving sort of digital divide? Which areas have been disproportionately impacted by poor air quality? And only then can we start to sort of create a pathway of, okay, these are the most specific mobility solutions which address your specific needs. So as a rival, we are partnering with cities to try and make this possible because we recognize that cities are enormously complex and multifaceted and we cannot profess to be the experts and actually it needs this very sort of collaborative approach. Um, earlier this year, we were well, actually late last year, sorry, uh, we partnered with the city of Charlotte 
we actually signed a memorandum of understanding um, and identified kind of key areas that help support some of their sustainability and mobility objectives. Uh, but strictly speaking, it sort of comes down to public engagement and education, public private partnerships, zero emission city initiatives, research projects, pilot projects, um, and the list could go on and on. And I think if we're able to pull this off, and if we do this in the correct way, then actually we can start to make the intrinsically linked nature of mobility and urban environment work ever more closely together. And that means that every single insight that we're getting starts to inform the evolution of our products such that we can really, really start to generate truly fit for purpose, equitable transportation solutions for it for a particular city. So you can see that as a rival, we are making electric vehicles and that is vitally important to the world and to achieving uh, net zero emissions. But actually we're thinking beyond that um, and we're thinking about how can we make radically better cities by really focusing on what resiliency means for a specific uh, community. So I appreciate I've, I've rattled through that at, at enormous speed, but um, thank you so much for listening and please follow our website to get more and more news. Emergent, thank you so much. Um, it's a very interesting what you do, and uh, I think your title is very interesting, uh, and this whole, yeah, uh, holistic view on cities and what you do in cities. And let's see if uh, other car makers and mobility providers will maybe soon have a similar position to yours. Yeah. <laughs>